Whit Stillman joins me here in Studio Q. Hello. Thanks very much. Great to have you here. Thank you. This is not, I did not know this uh, novella, Lady Susan. It's one of the lesser stone, lesser known Jane Austens. What drew you to it? What did you like about this story? Well, I found it by accident. I was going back to check Northanger Abbey, which had been the only Jane Austen I hadn't liked when I was 18. And I went back to check to see if I still didn't like that. And in the Penguin edition of Northanger Abbey, they had a little copy of Lady Susan as an appendix. And I thought it was very funny. I first liked Oscar Wilde plays, and it reminded me of an Oscar Wilde play. It is. It's. I was surprised uh, at how funny it. Certainly, your film uh, of it was. But Lady Susan is um, is complicated. I mean, yes. we could tell a little bit about that in the clip yes. that we just heard. How do you feel about her? Well, I like her very much now. Um, I was worried now? about her. I was <laughs> yes, I was worried about her. I mean, when you do a film with two rather vicious female uh, characters as the protagonists, played in our film by Kate Beckinsale and Chloe Sevigny, my old friends from Last Days of Disco Days, um, it was challenging. I mean, some people sort of misread it the first time. And actually, the British distributor read the script and thought the characters were too negative or something like that. And is now now the distributor. They, they got to like it. And so we seem to have dodged the bullet of dislikable characters. They are so uh, sort of funnily, openly malicious and evil-minded, and people sort of enjoy them. They are almost such an extreme that they, and there's something about the way that they're played so well, um, especially Kate Beckinsale um, playing Lady Susan. She, I mean, she's without means, pretending that she's very upper class, a lot of dislikable qualities, and yet she's sort of, she's she plays it well. She plays it with humor, um, which clearly seemed to be important to you to include humor yes, in this? Yes. I mean, the the model I thought of for these kind of characters was a film I greatly enjoyed, um, a comedy called Dirty Rotten Scoundrels with Michael Caine and Steve Martin. And they made their scoundrelness kind of lovable. And I think that um, Kate and Chloe have done the same thing. I know you, you, you've, much has been written. Uh, you've talked a lot about your love of, of Jane Austen. Yes. So many people are obsessed with Jane Austen. Yes, with good reason. What is it for you? Why, why do you connect so strongly with her creative vision? Well, um, Jane Austen is admirable on, on almost every level. Um, she's very perceptive, very wise, and very funny. And what I found in doing this adaptation is in addition to all the good things you see when you read her novels, there's sort of deep character story in her works and even this very unlikely work that she never fully finished and never published in her lifetime. Even this very unlikely work has deeply sort of compelling currents in it that really helped the adaptation. What were the deeply compelling currents for you? Well, it's hard for me to describe, but um, there's really no reason for this um, material to work well. But it's worked better than any film I've worked on, um, where normally you really sweat the screenings and how people are going to react and all that. And it's been like a bit of a dream. It's gone uh, getting critical reviews, it's great been, it's reactions been a bit of at a dream. Sundance. Yeah. So Norm- what do you think is, is, is making it work? Well, I, it's just this alchemy of the Jane Austen story that in addition to the sort of surface um, humor and insight, there is something, some dynamic she she knows how to use to make characters compelling. Do you think, I mean, and I mentioned that you, you were also publishing a, Na- a Lady Susan novel in addition yes. to this movie. Yeah, we call everything love and friendship. That was one of the controversial changes we made, and it's the first decision I made when I started doing this. I don't like the title Lady Susan at all. And Jane Austen didn't use it. Um, she actually called, I believe she called Northanger Abbey Susan initially. And she ge- generally went in the direction of having very um, sonorous, significant titles. So her first version, um, Marianne and Eleanor, or Eleanor and Marianne became Sense and Sensibility. First Impressions became Pride and Prejudice. So I thought it was logical that Lady Susan becomes Love and Friendship. Mm. So both the film and the novel are called Love and Friendship. The full title of the novel is Love and Friendship in which Jane Austen's Lady Susan Vernon is entirely vindicated. And the idea is to reverse almost everything in 
Jane Austen's Lady Susan to show why Lady Susan was delightful and wonderful and virtuous and it was just the jealous um, and, and mean de Courcy family who, who with, mm. with the authoress's help, tried to defame her. And it's continuing something that's in the film. One of the sort of new elements of the film is a va- very major comic character, um, a- an actor named uh, Tom Bennett, who has a cult following in British TV as a comic actor. Um, he was really brilliant in our film. Is he Sir James Martin? He's Sir James Martin. The, the buffoonish character. Yes, a bit of a rattle. Certainly no Solomon. Um, and he, there are very few scenes with Sir James Martin, but he was so funny and so delightful in those scenes. I kept writing more and more scenes. I'd get up at four in the morning to write more scenes for uh, Sir James Martin. And then for the novel, his nephew, who adores his, his aunt, um, Susan Vernon, um, is the narrator. So I get to continue a bit the Martin strain of uh, absurd humor. There's another book coming out at the same time, uh, a new novel by Curtis Sittenfeld, also based on Jane Austen. Do you think that, and perhaps you can only speak for yourself here, but do you think that this, uh, does Jane Austen speak to our times or for you is this more about a nostalgia for her time? Well, I don't think it's just about nostalgia for her time, although in our case, yes, because there are all kinds of beautiful, fascinating things from the 18th century that I greatly admire. And one is the music. And so um, our film, and, and Sony Classical agreed, and they're coming out with a soundtrack album. And so we recorded this music um, with a beautiful orchestra in Dublin. Um, and we go back further in time than the 1790s. That's the setting for, for our novel. It's early Austin, not Regency Austin. And... Um, the, the, you know, the music, the clothes, the, the, um, the architecture, the Pleiadian and Georgian architecture. So there are many elements that I really love. And I, I love having Austin set in her period. It, it's bringing all kinds of qualities. But I, I recognize that the Austin stories have that strong structure and the character dynamics that can work in other settings. So, I mean, I think the Bridget Jones use of it was very good. Um, I know that a lot of people um, like the film Clueless, so we can see that that the Jane Austen story dynamics can work in different periods, but I particularly like it set in the proper period. Your other films, um, your earlier films, are comedies of manners, people living in a bit of an insulated world, perhaps a lot in some ways like Jane Austen characters. Did you feel that you were doing then, um, albeit utterly different from Love and Friendship, did you feel you were doing something Austen-esque? Well, I'm going to argue with you because I don't think the characters in the other films were insulated. So we often show them in moments of their lives when they're in an insulated situation. So if they're in a Park Avenue um, apartment dressed up in tuxedos at 3 a.m. after a cotillion, that is isolating. But these kids actually are normal kids who then go back to college and are with everyone else. So um, I think there is a big connection between the more contemporary films I've worked on, such as Metropolitan and Last Days of Disco, and and this world of Jane Austen. Um, because as a writer, you, in a sense, are reprocessing what you've loved as a reader. And so since I've loved uh, Jane Austen and writers like F. Scott Fitzgerald and, and J.D. Salinger, who also both love Jane Austen, there is sort of a recycling of point of view and, and use of material. I mean, we're not terribly original. And that's p- perhaps part of her greatness, because the man she really admired was Samuel Johnson, Dr. Johnson. And one of his big arguments is that someone who originates a form has a strength and a power that those who come later... Um, don't don't achieve. And in a sense, in, in, in my view, I'm not a historian of literature, but for, as far as I know, Jane Austen kind of created this kind of novel, and it's still the, the, the greatest ones of the genre. You said that you personally feel a bit more at home in, in Jane Austen's time. What do you mean by that? Well, <clears throat> if you love um, anachronism and you sort of love past forms, now, today, there are many people, many of my friends, many people I like, who are very sort of anachronistic. They're not, they don't seem like people of today. And um, 
I like showing them in films. And then you get criticized saying that, oh, this is not typical of today and it's, it's strange and people don't talk that way and all kinds of things like that. And it's kind of a relief and, and a freedom to go back into the 18th century and try to be true to the 18th century. And people are not going to be saying, well, it's not true to the 18th century. Uh, and so I can have just wallow in anachronism. I mean, it's not anachronism. Um, wallow in, in the past and past modes um, without... The usual thing in our films is the characters in our films are sort of very old-fashioned. And then they could be criticized as, oh, they're not classical or they're not typical of today. But why is that something that you feel um, so comfortable in? I mean, you've described yourself as anti-modern. So why is it a relief for you to kind of go back to that um, Well, there's not that challenge of making everything sort of up-to-date. I mean, I think there's a sort of falseness of period. So... um, when we're in, for instance, 1952, not everything um, in the world of 1952 was created in 1952. And often one of, the, one of the sort of fictional things in film production is that people do this sort of heavy overlay of period. So 1950s will seem extremely 1950s, when in fact a lot of people are still living essentially the same way they did in the 1930s or 40s, and their furniture is still from these other periods. And that also exists for now, so everyone has to be totally up to date in social media and doing whatever is sort of dominant now. Everyone has to be doing that. And no one can be doing what actually significant minorities of people are doing or they're not doing exactly what everyone else is doing. And so if you jump back a couple of centuries, you sort of escape all these sort of this this forcing to be conformist with whatever is dominant today. Do you think, I mean, would you, if you could live in another era, another time, would you? I mean, you, not as a filmmaker even, but you, Whit Stillman, because a lot of what you're describing is sort of how you, you know, what approach maybe you bring to, or, or is brought to different eras of film. But for you, do you actually feel that you'd, you've, you'd fit in better or you'd feel more well, comfortable in that era? Well, I'm happy living in the present. Um, there have been periods in the, in the past that I thought were very bad patches and very bad periods, and I'm quite apprehensive about the future. So I'm happy living in, in the present. And one of the nice things about living in the present is so much of the past is still with us. It really hasn't changed that much. So sometimes when people are saying, oh, um, the 1790s is so different, everything's so different, how are these people relevant? And I don't think it's that different. I think there are a lot of the things that are very much the same, their conversations, their interests, their, their passions. It's, a lot of things are the same. Um, I do greatly admire um, the second half of the 18th century. I do think that it, it reached an apex of achievement in many areas, and there's been decline and dramatic decline since then. So um, I don't want to live back then. There are all kinds of inconveniences. They're very comfortable things now. Um, but creatively, you feel like there were greater achievements? Um, I, think, I think in the world of music and art, um, dress, uh, architecture, I think it was a superior period. What do you think about, I mean, there's this golden age thinking, as it's called, believing that other eras are better um, when really all times are hard. Do you think that that's, um, you're not overly romanticizing, uh, I hear you saying that, but do you you think that, are you guilty a little bit of that kind of golden age thinking? Well, probably, but I think that it's not like saying that I like everything from then. It's that certain things I think were superior and that there's been a decline since then. So, yes, I'm very happy to have my... Um, Blackberry Classic 10 and very happy to have all these things and very happy to be able to make movies. My opportunity to make movies in 1795 would have been (laughs) severely limited. A little different. (laughs) And um, I liked being able to listen to the wonderful music composed by Handel and, uh, and, and others, you know, as I listen to it now. So there are very many things that are great now, but I just think that, um, there's sort of the dictatorship of the present where we look down on the past, and uh, I don't think we have any reason to look down on other periods. As a filmmaker, do you think that you may venture there again, having brought this period to life in Love and Friendship? It's so different from Last Days of Disco and Barcelona and Metropolitan. Do you feel like you'll come back to contemporary characters and times, or will you maybe hang around in the 18th century in another film? Well, I have an assignment now, which is continuing something which is contemporary. Um, It is a series for Amazon, which I hope will come to Canada. Um, 
it is um, called The Cosmopolitans. There's been one pilot done, and I have the commission to do six episodes. And I was sort of basing it on experiences I had in Paris 10 years ago. Um, and I hope to, you know, be able to make that, which is semi-contemporary. And, you know, we said it now, even if my own experiences were slightly earlier. And I also do hope to get back to um, this period from that we've done in Love and Friendship. I found it very congenial. And I, you know, if my c creative career is long enough, um, I would like to, to come back to it. Well, thanks for being here today to talk about it. And all the best with the continued success of the film. Thanks very much, and please enjoy living in the present. <laughs> Good advice.